Hello, another episode coming at you. First, I'll update you on the project. If you want to skip ahead to the workflow deep dive, use the timestamps in the description. I finished the second instrument panel. I made these a little different compared to the first ones because I want them to look like they're made by a different manufacturer. I still need to make the backing panel match the colour of the instruments. Now, I have to say this took way longer than I expected and I'm not happy with the rate of work, considering that it's the same workflow as the first set. And the reason is that I got lazy. Now, strategic laziness is good. We make artistic recreations that have to look convincing, which is not the same as realistic. So we use a lot of smoke and mirrors to reduce our workload. But being lazy in a bad way is a disaster, which is what happened to me. So I got lazy with naming objects, keeping them in layers, tracking instances, references, copies, tracking modifiers that were shared across objects and tracking where those modifiers were in the stack. And in the end, I had to redo a lot of work, sometimes multiple times, and it was not fun at all. And it was totally my own fault. So the lesson is plan your laziness ahead of time and never ever get lazy with scene organization. I think these materials need another pass, but I think I'll do that when more of the assets are ready for texturing so I can see how they look next to each other in Painter. But for now I needed to take a break from these panels, just to protect my sanity. I've modelled a lot of the structure of the inside wall. I haven't done materials yet, but they are unwrapped. But I'll talk about how I did that in the next episode. For now, I want to take a deep dive into my workflow. So let's talk about importing geometry from CAD programs. A lot of the models that you can see here were made in Fusion 360, like this hatch, this hatch, and some of these instruments. I use Fusion 360 and Max. You could use SolidWorks, Rhino, anything that can export a .igs. Max has fantastic support for CAD files, but I don't know about other packages like Maya or Blender. I'll cover a high poly workflow first, and then I'll talk about high to low baking. If you do hard surface work and you haven't tried CAD modeling, I suggest you drop everything and try it now. There's a free version of Fusion available, so there's no excuse. Let's take a moment to consider how CAD modeling is different to polygonal or sub-D before we look at the procedure of importing. CAD modeling, be it solids or surfaces, is totally independent of topology and triangle count, meaning that we're describing to the computer the truest representation of a 3D form with dimensions, constraints and specified continuity between the surfaces. It's as if it had infinite resolution. And what you see on the screen and the mesh that you'll end up with in Max is always an approximation of that true form. At some point in the conversion process, you need to decide how close you want your mesh to match that perfect form. Conversely, in Max, if we make the same form with polygonal modeling, Max has no concept of constraints or continuity. All it knows is where I put the vertices. And even with subdivision, it doesn't have anywhere near the level of specificity that CAD does. It's just interpolating between the vertices that I specify. What does this mean for low poly modeling? Because Fusion knows what the true ideal 3D form is, when it generates the approximation, it will tweak the normals to imitate the true surface, which in practice means that even with a very low poly mesh, the approximation will have perfect shading. This is a CAD mesh on the left, and on the right is a similar mesh I made with polygonal geometry in Max, and you can see that there are shading artifacts. This is a common issue that happens with very low poly hard surface modeling. Secondly, the low poly model will always have inherent UVs without adding any UV mapping ourselves, whereas a low poly polygonal mesh will often have scrambled UVs. And thirdly, depending on the import process we use, we will have a watertight mesh. If I go into border sub-object mode and I hit Control A, I can't actually select any open borders because there are none, whereas a polygonal mesh might have unwelded vertices or overlapping polygons here and there. Now in this case, this is a fairly simple polygonal mesh and it happens to be watertight. So CAD modeling will produce meshes with clean geometry, inherent UVs, and most importantly, explicit normals. And we need to make sure that we preserve these three aspects of our model as we import it into Max. Let's take a look at our options for importing CAD geometry into Max. First thing is that you can right click any body and click save as mesh. This will give you a preview of your mesh, but this also means that you're committing to a polygonal mesh as we export from Fusion, either as an STL or an OBJ. Clicking File Export will give you more format options. Some of these are totally irrelevant for us, but 
there are some CAD formats here like IGS, STEP and SAT. If we choose one of these instead of a polygonal format, it means we can do our mesh conversion as we import or after we import into Max. So I've gone through all the relevant options and I've laid out the imported geometry in Max, so let's compare them. The first thing is the scale is off by a factor of 10 with the ones that I exported as polygonal geometry. The OBJ is rotated 90 degrees and the STL is strangely off-center. The CAD formats came in at the right scale, but if you click File Export in Fusion, it will export all visible bodies. We need to hide the bodies that we're not interested in in Fusion before we export. So let's do that and re-export the IGS. Okay, so with importing CAD formats, it asks us if we want to convert the mesh now or keep it as CAD geometry. For now, I'll keep it as CAD geometry, but I will come back to this. So we've re-imported the IGS. Once you've imported them in Max, they're completely identical. They're all body objects. In practice, I always use IGS. I've never used any of the other formats. So at this point, we can delete the step and the sat. Let's scale these down and think back to the three key aspects of the mesh. Geometry, UVs and normals. I can tell by the shading artifacts that the STL didn't preserve the normals. Let's check the UVs. We can throw on a UV checker material and already we can see that the STL didn't preserve UVs. IGS looks good, STL has nuked the UVs, and OBJ looks good. So the thing is with STL, it's a format that's used for rapid prototyping like 3D printing and stereolithography. So it's no surprise that it didn't preserve the normals and UVs, which are relevant for making physical models. So STL is useless for us, let's delete it. Apart from the rotation and scale, which are easily fixed, OBJ looks like a good option. Let's take a look at the IGS. Remember that I haven't converted this into a polygonal mesh yet, which means that Max still has this true representation of the infinite resolution form, and what you're seeing in the viewport is an approximation. You get a little more granular control of that approximated mesh in the body object type in Max. For high poly work, you just need to click on the find preset. Clearly, some of the UV islands will need to be remapped. This typically happens with revolve operations in Fusion, so let's rectify this. Let's select some triangles from these islands and use this script which I found online. I'll have a link to this in the description and shout out to this guy or gal monster for sharing it. This script expands my selection to the island borders. Quick planar map and let's quickly pack these UVs. I'm going to use the basic UV packer that ships with Max. If you wanted you could tweak these islands and use a more advanced UV packer if you have one to get more mileage from your texture resolution. But for this demonstration I'll just leave these as they are. This is now ready for export to Substance Painter for texturing if you're using a high poly pipeline. Note that as soon as you put any modifier on that allows topology specific operations, in this case selecting sub-objects, Max treats the object as a polygonal mesh using the viewport approximation settings specified here. Obviously if you change the approximation values it might screw up subsequent modifiers that are topology dependent. So if I change this to course, my UVW unwrap will reset. Non-topology dependent modifiers will be unaffected by changes at the base of the stack as usual. Let's take a look at some of the specificities regarding high to low poly baking. In Fusion, you should always do your fit as last and you export the high poly as we saw previously. Then roll back to just before your fillets and suppress any features that you don't want in your low poly. You export this as an IGS and this will be the base for the low poly. I'll import the low poly a second time, but this time I'll convert it to a mesh as we import. This way we can compare the first, which is imported as a CAD model and then converted in the scene, versus converting as we import, as we're doing now. The first thing is that we only have one slider and we don't have a preview, so it will take a few tries before you get the right mesh density. I'm gonna leave it at minus 10 because I want a very low poly mesh. Let's check the normals. There are no shading artifacts and the material looks good. We can check the UVs with our UV checker material. They look good. So let's pack them into the zero to one UV space with the basic UV packer. That's fine. And now let's also check the geometry. We can't select any open borders, meaning there are no open borders. And we can also use a modifier called STL check, which will check for open borders and overlapping vertices. It basically checks if you have a watertight mesh. And our geometry checks out, so that's good. So this means we have watertight geometry and it's preserved the UVs and the normals, which are the three essential aspects to a model that we discussed earlier.
Let's see what happens if we take our other low poly CAD object and convert it to a mesh. Let's put an edit poly modifier on and we can see that each surface is a separate element with lots of open borders. If we go back and click weld smooth it changes nothing. We can see if we zoom in that the vertices on the borders don't even match so clearly this won't work. There are some cases where you can select the borders, convert your selection to vertices and weld and it might give you a watertight mesh but doing so will usually destroy your normals which makes your mesh useless anyway. So this is not a viable option so let's delete this object. It looks like our OBJ export and IGS export are the only options that give us a usable mesh. The OBJ might require rescaling and orientation, but it does give a decent mesh density control on export, although that also depends on the program that you use, in my case Fusion 360. But in practice I've always used IGS and converted on import as we did for this one. So this is the pipeline that I use to get my CAD geometry into max, and from there we can do our high to low poly bakes. I want to point out a few other things regarding the mesh that we just imported. If you convert it to an editable poly and select all the polygons, you'll see that there are no smoothing groups assigned. Usually we use smoothing groups to manipulate normals either by unifying them to their average values or by breaking them to their individual values. But because the normals of our mesh have been explicitly defined by Fusion, and we can check that by using an edit normals modifier, we see that they're green, so they're explicit. If I reset them they turn blue, no longer explicit. So this means that smoothing groups are irrelevant for our mesh. But having said that, they are handy for other purposes like making selections. So I would recommend running this script as soon as you import your mesh. Shout out to Render HJS for sharing this, and I'll include a link in the description. This will assign smoothing groups according to the UV islands would be if they were defined by the normals. Now if we select our polygons, we can see we have smoothing groups, and doing this won't change explicit normals. In practice, these low poly meshes often need some optimization and cleanup before it's ready for a game. Usually you would do that with an edit poly modifier, but it's very easy to accidentally reset normals to their true values, and often you won't notice this until it's too late, so always work on a copy. Also, sometimes subsequent modifiers on an edit poly object will reset the normals, even if they appear intact in the edit poly modifier. I'll put a basic material on this mesh, and then I'll put a symmetry modifier and you can see that it's broken the normals. We can see some shading artifacts. So if you don't need to do any cleanup or optimization, which is quite rare, just leave it as an editable mesh. For some reason that I don't understand, edit mesh objects don't do this. If you have to tweak it with an edit poly modifier, before you put any subsequent modifiers on, you could drop an edit mesh modifier on. And as you can see, this will pass intact normals up the modifier stack. The only issue is that this modifier is topology dependent. But I just noticed when I was recording this video that the STL check modifier will do the same thing. So I'm guessing that this modifier outputs an edit mesh object to pass up the stack. And in fact, we can check that by collapsing the stack with the STL check modifier and it gives us an edit mesh object. Without the STL check modifier, we get an edit poly object. So just keep an STL check modifier on top of any edit poly modifiers that you have in the stack when you're editing these objects. That concludes this deep dive into my pipeline. I hope you found this helpful and I will see you in the next one.